where, where do all these sharding and DAP network IBC roads actually lead to? So I think one thing, you know, Benny and Tal have always spoke about is how this, the DAP network builds out, you know, piece by piece in a, in a strategic fashion. And I think uh, the end goal is to uh, have this, you know, blockchain agnostic scaling across multiple chains, you know, that if one chain scales, they all scale kind of a situation. Uh, with the DAP network serving as the super glue connecting these various chains, uh, allowing them to communicate with each other, to send data and value across, and to you know scale to new heights and eventually reach the levels of throughput that that would enable you know the actual real world use cases. Welcome back to DAP Talk TV, the communication with the Liquid Apps team and the DAP Network community. I'm here with Dudu and Benny. We're going to have this roundtable discussion because there's a lot of excitement happening on the DAP Network over the last few weeks. And there's a lot of things coming up ahead that we're going to kind of talk about here. We saw uh, EOS DT, also called Equilibrium. They deployed their DSP a few weeks ago. They've been working on Liquid Oracles. What, what do you guys think of that? I'm very excited about that, personally. Uh, I've been speaking with Alex for uh, uh from the beginning actually and they have a great team they have a great product and i i'm very happy to see that uh they were they really really did manage to get themselves uh uh high up uh in the eos ecosystem mm -hmm. uh now actually they even they even created a multi-sig on their contract um getting more decentralization up and running and to top it all like the cherry on top uh, I feel like uh, it's it's okay to stay now. Probably by the time that this is this video is out, uh, that uh, they are going to run an an implementation of Liquid Oracles um, for EOS DT, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the coolest things with what they're doing with the oracles are not only are they using a decentralized oracle system like Liquid Oracles but then they're using other Oracle systems on top of that and aggregating them all together. So they're, they're taking in price feeds from liquid oracles from multiple DSPs. They're collecting data from the Delphi oracles, which are uh, oracles on EOS run by some of the block producers. And then they're also uh, taking a price feed from another uh, Oracle service called provable or Oracleize. So they're taking all of these different data sources and they're, they're aggregating them together to almost, create an immortal Oracle in, in some ways. Um, I, I think the way they set it up, it would, it would be impossible uh, on equilibrium for what happened on March 12th in Ethereum DeFi to happen on ESDT. And I think that's something we're going to see moving forward on, on that network DeFi. But I think, I think it's going to trickle over into Ethereum eventually also. And we're going to start seeing uh, more systems like this. I think we're starting to see like DeFi 2.0. We're, we're starting to see like the next generation of DeFi. Did you guys see, uh, I know you saw it, the EOS options announcement uh, about a week ago. <laughs> Super. What did you guys think of that? Because I wasn't, I'm embarrassed that I wasn't in contact with the team. They didn't reach out to us to talk about it. They were just heads down building a, a team of, with high frequency trading backgrounds, quantitative trade, like quant backgrounds, like super advanced. This actually instruments. makes me happy. I have to say before Dudu answers about uh, EOS options, I thought that you wanted to talk Dudu. Um, I was happy about like them coming out in the open saying that they're going to use the DAP network without even speaking to uh, liquid apps or any of the DSPs beforehand. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, we see more community independence. You know, we see that the ecosystem uh, relies on itself, which is a very, very important part of uh, uh, the DAP network. And I think in, in any uh, blockchain ecosystem, you want to see such cases where people are just looking at the code, seeing how awesome this is, understanding how they can implement their product with it, using this code, and then just developing and developing uh, uh, their use case uh, using the uh, ecosystem's help or uh, uh, liquid apps's help, uh, but releasing it on their own. You know, that's amazing for, from my standpoint. It's shown a maturation of the network itself, as well as the onboarding materials and documentations from 
uh, the technical team here at Liquid Apps. Definitely. Uh, how about you, dude? What do you think of the DeFi happening on Dapp Network? I think one thing that, that EOS option kind of, they drew it out. Sometimes when you visualize it, it becomes more clear. They, they showed a, a graph with a bunch of different DSPs feeding uh, price information to sort of a, a, a central place, a chain almost. And over there, the chain was aggregating uh, all the inputs and pumping out one answer. Uh, some sort of aggregated answer that, you know, would, would be used within their DAP. So, you know, you mentioned uh, the fact that EOSTT are using other oracles in addition to Liquid Oracles, and that, that's great. That's by design. Liquid Oracle uh, isn't designed to be, uh, you know, a, the, the only data source. Liquid Oracles is a platform that allows you to use whichever data sources and whichever DSPs in whatever combination you want to achieve the level of decentralization you want. So, uh, you know, redundancy, uh, security through redundancy is the bedrock of, 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 of the, our ecosystem. And it's exciting that, you know, DeFi projects are realizing this and they using liquid oracles in this fashion uh, in a way that, you know, it gives them these robust price feed that update, you know, every half second. So that's cool to watch. And, and I'm very excited that more half frequency trading type of guys and more quantitative financial robustness is entering the DeFi space. So, uh, you know, let's keep one to watch, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. Dudu, I couldn't say it better myself. I feel like from the beginning, we said that Liquid Oracles is supposed to be running in such a fashion where you have multiple uh, uh, sources of uh, information, which you aggregate as you see fit. And I feel like with this equilibrium uh, did a great job, uh, you know, kind of taking points from different uh, uh, oracles, aggregating them and giving you the result. I can't wait to see this in action. We, we mentioned EOSTT, EOS option. So we have stable tokens, we have derivatives platform, and then the most, the other exciting project that's uh, due to launch very soon on the mainnet is uh, Chintai, who have right. announced that they're coming live mid June, which is a rental market for resources, which is truly unique to the blockchain space. It's a way to do DeFi that didn't it doesn't exist in you know in the traditional financial space and uh you know they're integrating that tokens uh they're integrating debt leasing and leasing markets open up a whole new way for uh resource allocation uh, for resource allocation that is more efficient we know how the network can get congested at time how uh, you know resources can get they tend to be a little volatile uh, so the resource market we saw with, with you know, when Rex and came out on the EOS mainnet, uh, how that kind of helped developers get a new uh, an avenue of accessing resources. And, you know, with Chintai launching DAP leasing, that will give uh, developers on the DAP network an opportunity to tap into a pool uh, of, uh, of resources uh, on a pay-as-you-go model similar to what Blockstart have already showcased. Benny, what, what do you think of having a resource market for, for the DAP tokens? This was something that was first hinted at in the white paper and it was never intended to be built by Liquid Apps. It was something built by the DAP network community, but it's going to have an enormous impact on the DAP network ecosystem. Um, in, in, in what ways do you think it, that having a resource lending market will improve the developer experience on the DAP network? I feel like uh, we need to see any utility token as, as you would see real estate in the real world. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, sometimes you have enough capital to actually buy a building and rent it out. Sometimes you don't have enough money in order to buy the building and you need to rent an apartment in the building. Uh, in both cases, you use these instruments within your day-to-day -day development. So if I'm looking at the developer's world right now, we know that uh, 
not all developers are followed by a massive VC round or someone who backs them and give them uh, a lot of uh, uh, capital. So we wanted to make sure uh, in our conversation with uh, Chintai and others, uh, Roman did his own uh, kind of model, uh, pay as you go model, you know, some, some, something sim similar to Rex uh, in that sense. Uh, and we, when we talked to both of them, we wanted to make sure that they can offer a great service to the developers, allowing them to be able to only rent the app tokens for, the, for their utilization other than um, to buy them if they don't have enough uh, capital. I feel like this is something that's very important in utility tokens, uh, especially when you know uh, the target audience, you know, developers aren't necessarily uh, well-funded, as I said, and this will bring a lot more usage to the network as a whole, knowing that right now I don't need to buy. I can rent, I can check before buying, I can do this and that, and it creates another level on top of the free market ecosystem that currently exists out there. It brings forth another dimension to it. It allows for DAP developers to be renting. It allows DAP holders uh, to lease their tokens. And it makes a lot more sense with this, uh, with this capability uh, enabled. Mm -hmm. And it's also just exciting to see the Shintai team uh, working so closely with the DAP network products because there's a lot of use cases and advantages that Shintai is going to see moving forward, especially with the cross-chain VRAM, the cross-chain accounts, being able to expand this marketplace to any EOS IO chain, just because of tapping into the DAP network. Uh, and soon- why are, you, why are you limiting yourself to EOS IO? Exactly. They, <laughs> it is, I already did the research. I know there isn't one. There's no rental markets on Ethereum, for example. So, Duda, you mentioned Ramon earlier in Blockstart, what they did with Moonlighting. Um, whenever Moonlighting, with the pay-as-you-go model, they went from having to pay, I don't remember if it was daily or monthly, but $2,000 of RAM, they reduced to $10 a day for, for using VRAM instead. So, it's a huge cost reduction. I think that's what we're going to see with Shintai. But we're talking about what's been happening on the DAP network and the things that have us excited, the things coming out of DAP solutions and Blockstart. And I'm talking about Blockument. I'm talking about DAP account. I'm talking about their accelerators and incubators that they've, they've announced and launched that are going to onboard new projects onto the DAP network. Uh, what do you guys think of what, what's been happening out of those two teams? Very excited. You know, it's very exciting. I'm speaking with both of them um, every, every couple of weeks and seeing how things unfold over there and They've been following, following us from the beginning. I don't know how many of you uh, know this, but the first time I met uh, Jason was actually in Washington uh, on the June, June, one, June 1st event of uh, B1. And he created the first DSP meetups over there. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, you know, I met him, I met Roman, I met a bunch of other BPs and people that came along to see what, what it's all about. And me and Roman had a very vocal discussion about why do you need uh, the DAP network? Why do you need VRAM back in the day? And I don't, he was not positive. He wasn't, he wasn't for it from the beginning, you know? Um, but once the conversation unfolded, I think he and the rest of the room understood what can be, what can become out of it. And, you know, seeing both of them right now kind of creating a partnership is very, first of all, kind of like a, going in a full circle, uh, with this. And more than that, it relates to what Tal and I thought from the beginning when we, when we thought about the DSP model, we saw this as the, the marketing extension 
if you will. Since the DSPs are the one that actually provide the service and they're the front facing when it comes to their uh, users, um, the, the DAP developers, we saw exactly what they're creating and uh, other created before them, Michael from uh, Multiblock, for example, which is a marketing arm that is extending the DAP network capabilities and reach, uh, whether it is for the same audience or for new segments. And I think that's where we can expect them to be uh, uh, aiming for. You mentioned where you first met Jason. So I think I'll tell a story of how I first met Jason and it ties into what, what I think is a unique value proposition in this collab. Uh, at Jason, before in his previous life, was a audiologist. He had a very successful company selling uh, hearing aid software. And I myself have a like a hearing problem and for a while I was you know hesitant to get the, the aids and you know when I met Jason I was like okay this is a cool guy successful guy makes hearing aids and wears them as well you know maybe it's time to you know go go get my own pair so he got he helped me out with, with the selection but uh, it's great to see people that he comes from hearing like that at the, at the business. It's, a, it's not a anarchist, uh, you know, mm -hmm. punks from the mom's basement that are exploring, uh, you know, technology for the first time. These are, you know, business people, enterprise with enterprise facing uh, client uh, operation. And, you know, you take that and then you take uh, block starts, development uh, chops, and you create this like, better together synergy where each one brings a complementary piece that creates a, a, a package that's greater than the sum of its parts. So, uh, you know, I think that's unique to this collaboration and unique to collaboration in the blockchain space in general is that, you know, that there's no uh, zero sum competition and tribalism uh, is counterproductive over here. And, you know, the way to go about uh, you know, the dynamics between entities, between communities, between networks, between projects is to create sort of a co collaborative synergy where, you know, everyone can gain and everyone can win. I feel like this is very exciting. Uh, I feel like a lot of DAP developers that currently, uh, you know, watch this should be aware that they can and should think about the business model of what they're building from day one. Uh, you know, I'm speaking with uh, many dApps and I know that it sounds like it's something very obvious, but apparently it's not. And I, it's my personal opinion, not everybody agrees with this, but I do feel like you should get some sense of where you're going with your product um, and how are you gain, going to get fun in you know, from either the crypto world or the real world, which is a much bigger market. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, having a business oriented people within this ecosystem is very, very important. I, I, ho I actually, myself, I help at least uh, two dApps a week, uh, kind of like iterate and think through different ideas that they have uh, for business models and implementations and where to go and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if any of the people that watches wants, uh, you know, uh, some advice, they're more than willing to approach. Uh, ben, I, I ben, don't you know don't, many people. You don't like to brag, but we've never, I don't think we've discussed it in depth, but your background before going full-time blockchain, you worked as a consultant for Ernst & Young. Yeah advising startups on creating these business strategies, essentially. You want to kind of explain a little bit about what you did? Uh, sure. Um, basically, it's, uh, it's called TAS, uh, Transaction Advisory Services, but we did the strategy consulting as, as part of it. And basically, uh, companies approached us, whether it's startups or like government uh, uh, facilities. Um, and asked us like 
many different questions. Whether it is, uh, what should I be doing right now in order to uh, advance my business? Or what do you think about this and that business model? Or how will my industry look in 30 years? And how do I uh, uh, make sure that I align myself right now to what the future holds? So um, many different projects, many different faces, many different teams. Uh, and you needed to kind of get in, understand it, uh, an industry that you basically sometimes never heard of before. Um, understand uh, uh, the players, competitors, what up, uh, uh, advantages, disadvantages, you know, SWOT analysis is something that probably most people here uh, heard of. Uh, and kind of go through the team with the team and with other teams across the world from EY to learn what is the base, what is the best solution for this specific company in order to succeed, in order to answer the question that they asked. It can be anything from a, a coherent uh, strategy and to an M&A strategy. You know, may, maybe they're, that, that's enough. Maybe they did <laughs> enough, maybe they're, outgrown themselves they want to you know advance to the next uh, uh, the next level uh, in need of different uh, companions so yeah it varies obviously you know uh, what brought me into the startup world is the fact that I've seen many many different industries and startup startups always seemed like most exciting for me mm. uh, because of the, 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 the innovation and the fact that you need to really align yourself quickly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about my, my <laughs> but, past. But circling back, your DMs are always open. You might be busy, it might take you a little bit of time to get back, but you are very responsive for a CEO, very available for if people want, want to use your wealth of knowledge. If, if you're able to, I, I know you do help. Um, and I just want to recap before we move on to the next topic. We have some really smart people working on the DAP network. Did you guys realize that we have two like doctors that are operating DSPs? Michael Gucci from Multiblock was an ER surgeon. I don't think he practices anymore. And then Jason Kemp from DAP Solutions is a doctor of audiology. Amazing. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting there. Um, let's get into sharding. Uh, Benny, you've talked about sharding. You kind of hinted at it and teased it uh, for a while now, a couple months now. So we kind of te telegraphed that it was coming, but uh, I think it's more in your face now. So we released an article last week that describes how sharding is available now today via liquid chains. This is something that's very, very excites me very much. Uh, I feel like uh, we have been having this vision of how this ecosystem should look like, how it should be uh, connected, how it should be not a one chain platform. Uh, and I feel like we're not the only one with this vision anymore, which is great. You know, um, we're talking about uh, EOS being expensive. Now it's okay again because people left it. But at the end of the day, it seems like it all leads to uh, uh, a mainnet that is kind of the ledger and many other chains connected to it uh, with things actually happening on top of. And you know how we had RAM as a limitation because it was expensive. And we created VRAM. So now you can have infinite amount of memory for that. I feel like here with sharding, it's the same for the 30 millisecond limitation that EOS has today for computation. So how can you have a calculation of something that's requiring more time? Um, and that's what brought us to in this whole sharding in the first place. How do you create multiple shards and have memory uh, uh, shared in acro all across them and how do you step away from only EOS and allow for multiple blockchains to be using this technology, knowing that uh, 
this specific technology is being delayed for quite some time by some of them. Um, and I feel like that's an amazing feat, an amazing achievement. And like here, I can say that we have an amazing team uh, for being succeed, succeeding in doing something that many others have tried for so long and failed. And I'm extremely happy for being the CEO of such an amazing group of people, uh, you two included, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the th thanks for the prop, Betty. Uh, you're you're amazing yourself. Uh, uh, but I think I think what's important to note in sharding what you mentioned is that uh, this this idea isn't something that sprung up yesterday. This uh, it's borrowed actually from in the traditional database space where you know you you can scale a database vertically by adding more capacity to a single database, or you can spread them, them out spread a single data set out across many database and have each one remember a smaller bit of information that when aggregated together becomes a lot bigger than the sum of its parts. So uh, the similar mechanism is being, it's not just sharding, right? A lot of different networks are trying to uh, go this divide and conquer route to scale where you want to try and split up instead of having all the heavy lifting done on a main chain. You leave the main chain, as Benny mentioned, for a ledger of public proofs and a liquidity hub uh, for a connecting network of side chains, each one that can come customized with its own uh, with its own characteristics. And I think that's one of the advantages of, of liquid chains as a sharding mechanism, as a scaling solution for Ethereum and, and multiple other chains is that you not only do you get the you know second layer uh, computation, the trustless gas reduced computation, but you can also integrate any number of DAP network services directly in the chain uh, for added functionality. So RPFS hosting and Oracle, and liquid scheduler and 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 storage, whatever you whatever services you need can come baked into this uh, you know half powered chart. And thanks to DAP RBC, that chart can maintain a two way connection to to the main net uh, for data and, and value transfer. So uh, you know it's exciting that. You know, these to see how innovation compounds on itself. How you know, concept from older technologies are brought forward and implemented by, as Benny said, uh, an amazing tech team uh, to bring it towards the 21st century and towards the blockchain scalability space. So, wh where do all these sharding and DAP network IBC roads actually lead to? So I think one thing, you know, Benny and Tal have always spoke about is how this, the DAP network builds out, you know, piece by piece in a, in a strategic fashion. And I think uh, the end goal is to uh, have this, you know, blockchain agnostic scaling across multiple chains. You know, that if one chain scales, they all scale kind of a situation uh, with the DAP network serving as the super glue connecting these various chains. Uh, allowing them to communicate with each other to send data and value across and to you know scale to new heights and eventually reach the levels of throughput that that would enable you know the actual real world use cases that you know we've all uh, can you know envision coming out and, and making their mark on blockchain and on the world. I couldn't say it better myself, Dudu, thank you. It's, I think it's all about new technologies and how long it takes in order for people to get, accept, and actually implement uh, their own ideas on top of new technology. And these things take a lot of time. Uh, and we saw this, we created the DAP network about a year and a few months ago. And uh, we had a few implementations in the beginning but I feel like in the last few months, we see a storm of developers coming in, understanding the deep tech, diving into it, and you know, going all in. Because they understand how 
amazing this technology can affect their day-to-day -day lives and their DAP itself. How much better the DAP can be and how better it will serve their users by implementing DAP network capabilities on top of it. And you know, with each and every service that was developed and deployed, we saw more interest coming in. And I'm very, very, I can't tell you how excited I am um, from seeing everybody coming together uh, and, and actually uh, either share that they develop on the DAP network or post that they're running things uh, uh, currently live on production using DAP services or not talking about this and we'll probably hear about this uh, not long from now. And I feel like it's only the beginning uh, because the community is now being built. We're not in 2017 anymore. That's, I'm saying this a lot, but in a way, I don't think people understand what I mean by this. We are building, we're creating tools, we're creating value for people. And we're not alone in this. We have a full on uh, uh, community that's developing and dedicated and understand the bigger vision. And I feel like that, that, that's what I mean by technology takes time and we are hitting the curve, you know, we're, we're getting there. And uh, that fills me with joy. And I know that Tal feels exactly the same way. And uh, yeah, let's see what tomorrow brings, you know? I think that's a good spot to leave off on. Let's see what tomorrow brings, because I think as exciting as today is, as exciting as yesterday was, I think tomorrow is going to, the best is yet to come, but let's just say that. Okay. Right. So let us know in the comments what you thought about this discussion, what you want us to talk about next. DAP Talk TV is an open communication with the DAP network community. We're going to constantly be bringing on the thought leaders and the project developers on here, as well as the Liquid Apps team to have this open communication. Let us know what you think in the comments. Give us that thumbs up, hit subscribe, and see you guys next time.